have been uh, asked to be the last speaker uh, of today. Um, I know, of course, that you will all be, uh, ex that you're already extremely tired at this moment. Uh, but the fun thing is that I will be talking about logic and creativity. And you see the subtitle, A False Opposition. Now, it, it, it will mainly be about logic. But the fun thing is uh, that you don't have to think. Okay? So just let your mind go all possible ways, because I will try to show you... What I want to try to show you is this. Um, in Western philosophy, for over more than 2,000 years, I'm not exaggerating here, over more than 2,000 years, there was always the idea that you have logicians on the one hand, and you have creative people on the other hand. And the two will never meet. Uh, so you, can, you have this image of a logician, which does not correspond to me, uh, namely the kind of person with a very strict mind who follows the conclusions he or she has to follow with an inevitable force, whereas the creative mind can explore all the possibilities, etc. Well, first of all, um, if you do logical analysis, you get problems. And what I will do in the time uh, that I have at my disposal, I will show you some of these problems. And they, they are deep, deep, deep problems, also extremely amusing. Uh, and if you want to try to solve problems, you need creativity. So, that's me being logical, logical analysis needs creativity. It's even better. If you want to inverse uh, the whole story, if you want to be creative, you have to explore. But if you want to explore, then you need maps for exploration. Such maps need logical analysis. So, of inevitably, creativity needs logical analysis. So, right, this is the end of the talk. <laughs> I have made my point, so... Uh, <laughs> but I still have 16 minutes, so, okay. Let's have some fun. Okay, I'll start with a very simple problem. Uh, one of the problems that uh, logicians uh, think about uh, a great deal is how do we define things? I mean, uh, it's something that we, we don't do it on a daily basis, but very often when somebody asks you, uh, what is this? Then what you do is you give a description. You try to define what it is. Okay, let's take one of the most famous examples the, uh, from the British philosopher Bertrand Russell. Uh, and it goes as follows. Imagine a village, and in the village is a barber. And the barber is that person that shaves people. Now imagine that you give the following definition. Who is the barber in the village? Well, that's that person who shaves everybody who does not shave himself. S -s Sounds okay. I mean, okay, people who don't shave themselves go to the barber. It's a very neat village. I mean, clean people all over, so I'm, I'm not living there. Uh, they go to, to, uh, to the barber to get shaved. And then you realize this definition is no good, because the only question you have to ask, what should the poor barber do? Imagine the barber getting up in the morning. He goes into the bathroom, looks in the mirror, and he says, should I shave myself? He says, ah, no, I can't. Because I'm the person who shaves everybody who does not shave himself. Now, if I would shave myself, then I, don't ha then I can't go to the barber, but that's me. So I, I can't shave myself. But then, of course, he wonders, should I then not shave myself? And he says, well, that's no good, because then I belong to those people who come to me to get shaved. So now I have to shave myself. So he has to shave himself, if and only if, he does not have to shave himself. Right. Can you get out of this? Sure. That's a very easy solution. Take a woman. <laughs> and since I always have clever students in my uh, college classes, uh, one of them said, yes, but did you take into account the woman with the beard in the circus? I said, okay. So that's why it's added a woman without a beard. Yeah. <laughs> You can, of course, say, reject the definition. Okay, fine, but what, what are you then going to do? So, the question you then ask, and this is a question that is still an open question. We have no good, decent answer to it. Namely, how can we decide, when I give you a definition, how can you decide that that definition is okay? Well, the answer is, you can't. Here's another example, which one of my great favorites. Uh, okay, watches since time is uh, 
staring at me uh, at this very moment. This is a perfect example. Uh, suppose that you have the following definition. If you have two watches, one and two, then one is a better watch than two if one gives you more often correct time. That seems reasonable. No, it doesn't. It's a very bad idea because... <laughs> <laughs> if you have a broken watch that gives you two times a day the correct time, right? Whereas if you have a watch that runs ahead one minute, it never gives you the right time. So the broken watch is better than the other one. Okay? It's of course a bad definition because it doesn't tell you that you, you have to know when it gives you the correct time. Bad definition. Okay, let, let's forget about definitions. Let's take something more fun. Truth. Ah, <laughs> I was very pleased that Ted has as a subtitle ideas worth spreading. Not true ideas worth spreading, because otherwise I would not have been here today. Um, because I will show you I have no idea what truth is. Why? Okay, follow me for, for, for a moment. Assume the following. If I say something that is meaningful, then it is either true or false. At least in first order, we can accept it. I know we have plenty of occasions where we have doubts. Uh, is it raining or not raining? It's drizzling. Okay. Uh, but in that case, it is drizzling or not drizzling. Okay, fine. Uh, assume, keep the world simple for a moment. Either true or false. Right. Uh, secondly, right. Either the one or the other. That seems, okay, that's trivial. And this one too. Not both of them. I mean, you can't save of something that it is both true and false. That's excluded. Right? Doesn't this sound perfectly reasonable? It doesn't. <laughs> and this is the reason why. <laughs> the famous liar paradox. Okay? This sentence says, this, this sentence is not true. So this sentence says of itself that it is not true. It is meaningful. I assume that, every, that everybody here present knows what this statement says. It says about itself that it is not true. So we understand it. So that means it must have a truth value, either true or false. But now what happens? If it is true, then it turns out that it is not true. Of course, assume that the sentence is true. Then what the sentence says must be the case. What does it say? That it is not true. So if it is true, it is not true. That's okay. No, 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 that's fine, okay? Okay, but that's okay. Uh, you can conclude from that that it is not true. So then, assume that it is not true. What then? Well, if it is not true, then that is exactly what the sentence says. Now, if something says exactly what is the case, then it is true. So if it is not true, false, then it is true. It is true if and only if it is false. So there you have it. Ah, and then you say, okay, how can we get out of this? First, a warning, okay. Um, I have to confess, I'm a professor, so I'm a teacher, and I can't resist teaching. So here's a short moment uh, of teaching. Uh, you will learn something where you can embarrass logicians with. Okay? <laughs> so I'm now working against my own uh, trade union, uh, the United Force of uh, Logicians Worldwide. Uh, <laughs> if you now meet a logician, you can say, tell me, how about that problem? Namely, this problem. The, the uh, paradox that I just showed you is also known as the Epimenides paradox. And it goes as follows. All Cretans, you are on the island of Creta, and a Cretan says to you, I have to warn you, all Cretans are liars. Now, what are you supposed to do here? Well, very funny. First of all, a bit of theology. I mean, if you say logic, you say theology. I mean, <laughs> uh, what would uh, theologians be without logicians to prove the existence of God? which of course doesn't work. Uh, neither does the opposite, but that, that's another problem. Uh, and that's a different talk, by the way, also, which I have. So, okay, uh, also <laughs> word spreading. I told you I'm doing the thinking for you, okay? So you don't have to think. Um, actually, the Epimenides paradox, the first reference you get is in the Bible. And <laughs> it's in the epistle of Paul to Titus. Uh, Titus being sent off with his family, yes, his family, uh, to Crete to convert people there. And Paul gives him a warning. And that's chapter 1, verse 12. You may remain seated. Uh, one of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, idle glutens. And then Paul makes a horrible mistake. He says, this testimony is true. <laughs> Which proves that... 
in the early Roman Catholic Church, there weren't that many logicians around because they would have said, Paul, <laughs> don't write this. I mean, it's silly. Because what you have is the following situation. There is no paradox. So any logician will tell you, oh, this is definitely a paradox. It isn't. Why? Because it is not so that all Cretans are liars. Because you know, it is being said by a Cretan, so if the, what he says would be the case, then they are all liars, so he must be a liar. Okay? Now, what is the meaning of it is not so that all Cretans are liars? That is, that some of them are liars, and some of them speak the truth. Now, if it so happens that the Cretan that is telling you this is a liar, everything is fine. <laughs> it's basically a liar who has told you a lie. If he would have been a truth teller, then you would have had a problem. And that's exactly what Paul wrote. I mean, okay, right. Um, <laughs> I'm not going into a th uh, th theological discussion here. Uh, hence, this must be, okay, what? That's what, just what I said. How to solve it? I will be very brief, we don't know. One of the brute, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I mean. <laughs> This is no exaggeration. I mean, there are plenty of logicians who say, don't say such a thing. Uh, <laughs> I'm now saying a lie. Shut up. But, uh, <laughs> or you could say, well, there's more than true and false. You have true, you have false, and you have stuff in, uh, in between. That's a possibility. It's not a good possibility. Or why not? And this is something that logicians have been working on uh, since the 1950s, 60s. Why can't we reason? Uh, with sentences, statements, that are both true and false. So if you say, what's typical for a sentence like, it's Saturday today? Well, that in this case, it is true. Tomorrow, it will be false. Fine. What is typical for sentences such as, I'm rambling? Well, you have to decide. Uh, <laughs> and if you then ask, and what's typical for this sentence is not true? Answer, that it is both true and false. That's the, char the characteristic of it. Ah, lovely. Okay. Let's get closer to the world. I'm sure you all are familiar with Zeno's paradoxes. And we have a solution. That's nice. We have a solution. OK, you know the problem, of course. I mean, if I have to walk from here to there, I've, I've just done it. I mean, that's, uh, that's nice. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do it a second time, but now slightly different. I will let you know my thoughts. I have to go to there, so what, you, you know what? Let me first do half of it. Wow, I'm there already. Now, what remains, let me do half of that, and 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 half of that. I have to do an infinite number of things in a finite time. Well, your intuition must tell you that's impossible. How can you do an infinite number of things in a finite time? Well, the answer is, of course, you do it all the time. I mean, whether I'm making my thoughts explicit or not, in the meantime, I'm walking and I'm arriving here. So that seems to be all right. Yes, but assume the following. Let's make the process a bit more complicated. Let's assume that I do the following. I do half the distance, half of it, half of it, half of it, half of it. And in the meantime, when I, when, and I, when I go through the first distance, I say, yes, no, yes. No, yes, no, yes, you, yes, yes, no, no. I will do this an infinite number of times. Assume it, assume it. I mean, <laughs> we're doing logic. I mean, the real world doesn't, <laughs> doesn't interest us, okay? <laughs> the question you want, to, you want to answer is, what have you said just before you arrived there? And the answer is, you can't know, because there wasn't the last moment. When you said, okay, and now this is the final yes, no, because each yes was followed by a no, and each no by a yes, let alone the question, what, what are you saying when you are in B? I mean, you can say anything, <laughs> which is true. Now, <laughs> ah, very good, you don't believe me anymore. Right. <laughs> Let's make it more funny. Instead of yes, no, suppose that I count numbers, and I say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Fine. When I arrive in B, I will have counted all numbers. Good. Let's make no problem of it. Suppose now that the second person walks next to me, and I go through one, two. He goes through two, 
4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. The funny thing is that he does half the job. He's only counting the even numbers. Yet, when we, will, when we have arrived, we will both have counted an infinite number of numbers. So we have counted the same amount, but it's basically half of it. Yes. Okay, time is running out. <laughs> of course, time is running out. Um, I can't even arrive there. <laughs> okay, let's simply get back to ordinary reasoning. Okay, fine. Daily, daily reasoning. Good, 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 good. Let's see what that produces. Right. It is the case that I can say, standing here now, people, this is Saturday. And I say it unconditionally. If somebody says, yes, but suppose that you were 10 years older. I don't care, it would still be Saturday. <laughs> but that's dangerous. That, that's that's, that's not, not, not a good idea. Because what you say is this, so no matter what condition would be the case, what you have said remains. So you have to accept the truth of the following statement. <laughs> of course, I have said no matter what condition, it is Saturday. So what if you turn out to be the Pope, then it is still Saturday. But this sounds weird. If I am the Pope, then this is Saturday. No good, no good. Okay, perhaps in Orthodox, Greek or Russian uh, Catholicism, this could be possible. Uh, I could be a Pope, but that, that's a different thing. Um, Okay, next one. Oh, time is really running out here. So I have to speed up a little bit, okay? <laughs> Doesn't this sound reasonable? You have a beard. A beard must remain a beard if you just remove one hair. Of course. I mean, it can't be that somebody has a beard and you say, wait a second. Pluck. <laughs> ah, your beard is gone. Uh, that can't be the case. This is fine. Okay. So remove all the hairs on the beard one by one. At each step, you will claim, still a beard, still a beard, nope, still a beard, still a beard. <laughs> and so you will end up saying that no beard must be a beard. <clears throat> this is daily language. I mean, that's the way we talk with one another. And then people are confused that, that we don't understand one another. Everyday logic. Well, it has been said before, and actually, I have an example here. I, I didn't dare to show the film. Uh, because I'm not sure about the uh, political views of uh, the audience here. Uh, it's namely uh, Donald Rumsfeld. Okay, that's a bit delicate uh, Secretary of State in the, in the Bush uh, administration. But he, at one time he gave a, a press conference on the situation in Iraq. And he said, which was great, I mean, after, uh, after a few seconds the whole uh, assembled press was laughing. But what he was, what, what he was saying was totally logically correct. Well, there are things we know we know. There are things we know we don't know. But there are also things we don't know we don't know. Which is correct. There are things I know. There are things I do not know. There are things I know I know. There are things I know I do not know. And there are things I do not know I know. <laughs> but that's just me. Okay? Now I will put in you. I have to go very fast here because it now says 18 minutes idle. So I'm now being idle. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> now I will involve you. Things I know you know. Things you know I know. Uh, things I know you do not know. And things you know that I do not know. And we can go on. We can even... Uh, why, why not? Why not? Why not? Uh, yes. Things I know you do not know. That you do... do that, that you... That you... <laughs> know I do not know. Well, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so that's why a philosopher... When he ends up with this question, what's, what's a good question, he answers this. And if somebody asks a second question, what's a good answer to that question, then he answers that is. <laughs> okay, I'm now going to rush off the stage because I'm uh, really over time, and I leave you with one important warning. Thank you. <laughs>